Well, Cornerstone, I am excited to introduce to you a guest speaker for this weekend. Uh, his name is Phil Ling. Most of you don't know Phil Ling, but Phil is the director of The Giving Church. And The Giving Church and Phil and his team have been partnering with Cornerstone over the past three years through our Made for More campaign. And they've just been amazing advocates in helping us figure out how to do this campaign and become even more of a giving church. Before Phil was with The Giving Church and before we ever knew him at Cornerstone, Phil served as an executive vice president for the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. He's worked with John C. Maxwell and Enjoy and these massive organizations in the Christian world helping people realize their potential in giving and helping organizations increase in ministry. Since then, Phil's partnered with Cornerstone, and we're so thrilled that he's become not only a great resource, but an advocate for what we're trying to do. And I'm so glad to, for you to get to hear from him today. He's not only a, a church planter, a business entrepreneur, and a sixth generation Christian ministry leader. Phil's our friend, and he's a great advocate for the gospel. So would you please give a Cornerstone welcome to my friend and our speaker for this weekend, Phil Ling. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see your eyes. Isn't that odd? Uh, it has been a crazy time. Uh, for the last 20 years, I have uh, lived in Delta airplanes and been all over the country, worked with about 850 churches, and up until one year ago this month. And then everything just went crazy. This stopped. I remember I had my last plane ticket was to Long Island, New York last March, and Canceled that at the last minute. That pastor spent six weeks in the hospital with COVID and intensive care. And praise God, he's back as of two weeks ago. Uh, but it's been a crazy, crazy time. I've got a church in Orlando that eight of their members right now are in intensive care from one church. So it's, it's just been a crazy journey. And for somebody like me that lives all over the place and travels and all that. And suddenly you don't get on planes and you don't travel. And so you are my first one. So hopefully I don't infect you. No, <laughs> but I'm serious. It's, it, so it's a, it's a joy for me to be here. I have, love Pastor Chris. Love you guys. Uh, it is just a hoot to be here. I want to open up a section of scripture. It's one of my favorites. It's John chapter 12, first eight verses. So if you got your Bibles, John chapter 12, starting with verse one. This is a story, not a parable. You know, parables, if you're a little kid hanging out in Sunday school, you learned that parables were uh, earthly stories with heavenly meanings. And it's where Jesus would tell a story to illustrate a point. This is an actual circumstance. So this is not Jesus sitting on the hillside talking to a bunch of people, but it's the retelling of a circumstance, starting John chapter 12, starting at verse 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected, why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It's worth a year's wages. He didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was meant that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You'll always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Would you pray with me? Dear God, it's been a crazy time all across the world, not just in North America. And to be able to gather together with other believers, for some of us, it's, it's been a long time. And even with all the precautions and social distancing, there's just something about being with other brothers and sisters. And I thank you and I praise you for that. Guide us, help us be people of, of faith over fear. And for the next few minutes, help us to, to kind of dive down a little deeper into your word and to peel back layers of the story guided by your spirit. I praise you and thank you just for the opportunity that we get to do that, that we can read the word for ourselves and that you promise that if we take it into our lives, it will not come back void, that it will take root to make a difference in what we do. So for the next few minutes, block out everything else that's going on in the world and just concentrate on your truth. It's in Jesus' name, amen. What you spend money on says a lot about you. 
It's kind of like your priorities. And I don't mean just in a frivolous way, and I don't mean in what your house is or your car is, but those discretionary incomes. So we have a church that built a beautiful chapel for weddings, and it was right before COVID. And so that just like smashed. But now they got waiting lists, people lined up. And it's all those, those sad stories we heard for the last 12, 14 months. Now they're able to take place even with precautions. Did you know, I looked this up, the average cost of a middle-class wedding, so not Harry and Meghan getting married and what they spent, but the average cost of a middle-class wedding is $26,000. 26,000 bucks. When I got married in 1912, um, it was... It was <laughs> A long time ago. I mean, we were poor. I was a poor preacher guy. We, we got married uh, for our rehearsal dinner. We had Kentucky Fried Chicken with the buckets. And uh, we had our reception in a little barn, not making that up. And the nicest, most lavish gift we received was a set of tires for the car. And they were appreciated. So maybe it's not that. Maybe it's uh, churches spend money. You know, we've helped and worked with Uh, like I said, 800 churches and raised about a billion dollars over the years for all kinds of things. We've got helped a church buy a Walmart, one buy a Sam's Club in in Colorado Springs, have a couple of churches buy shopping malls or those that create new locations. A lot of churches like you that say, hey, we could help reach other communities with other locations. And so the cost of doing those things. And then then you say, well, that's a lot of money. I mean, is that a wise use of the cash? Should we spend that kind of money on those kind of projects? Or maybe it's personal entertainment. We, pre-COVID, like to do stuff. So you had an RV or you had a boat or you went on ski trips or maybe you went on a golfing trip. Well, that's different because that's ordained by God. But everything else is, is lavish. So where you spend money says a lot about who you are. And if you're not careful, you also open yourself up to criticism. This story, it's one of my favorites. Uh, Why? Because I I think there's a lot of, it's a culmination. So just as we're looking forward in just two weeks, we'll be finally able to gather together for Easter. This is six days before the Passover. And what this crowd doesn't know is that Jesus is going to be dead in just a matter of days. And so Everything, it's at the apex of his ministry and his influence. It's hosted in a nice home, Simon the leper. Now, if you realize that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels, are just different camera angles to the same movie. And it allows us to see it just a little bit differently. So you read John chapter 12, but you could also flip over to Mark chapter 14 and have the same story and get some more layers. So Simon the leper opens his home to host this event. Simon like his moniker, the leper. He was a man of wealth that realized wealth had its limitations because in the first century, once those little blisters started to show up and be visible, leprosy was something that not only could take your life, but it took your social standing and you literally were ostracized. Until you could show yourself to the priest that you were clean, you were kicked out of the community. Simon was in that role, in that realm, until he ran into Jesus. Jesus heals him. He is overwhelmed with joy. He says, I'll host the party. So he brings everybody together. And then it says that Lazarus is reclining at the table. Now, remember, we're just days away from the crucifixion. Lazarus has already died and been raised from the dead. Everybody knows that story. Non-believers know when you say Lazarus, isn't that a guy who died and came back from the dead? They might not know the story, but they know the name. That's Lazarus. Mary and Martha, her sisters are there. So if you've been hanging around church for just a little bit, you recognize some of these names. Mary, Martha, Lazarus. Judas is going to pop up here in just a minute. Simon the leper. And true to their personalities, these three siblings loved Jesus, very supportive, hosted him in, in their home many times. And Martha was always the one with the spirit of hospitality. So every time you see Martha's name pop up, she's doing something. She's helping somebody. Mary is more emotional, caught up in the moment. And the scripture just, in in, an understated way, says Lazarus is also reclining at the table. Now think about it. If you're invited to the dinner party and you get to select where you're going to sit, who do you want to sit by? Now I know your churchy answer is, I got to sit by Jesus. And I get that. I want to sit by Lazarus. Dude was dead. I got questions. Bright light, no bright light. Were you cold? Were you warm? Were you falling? Were you going through a tunnel? I mean, I I got questions. Lazarus has experienced that. So the setting, Simon's gleaming, proud. 
Lazarus reclining at the table, Martha is serving, and Mary notices a moment, an opportunity, a circumstance, and she leaves the room, secrets herself out, comes back, and she's got this jar. It, the scripture says it's a, it's a jar of nard. Now, it was a perfume, an ointment, that a family, if you had enough wealth, a family would save this until a loved one dies, and then they would use it in the anointment of the body in preparation for burial. It's only been, in human history, it's only been a relatively short amount of time that you and I have been separated by professionals that took care of all that. When somebody dies, you make a phone call, it's taken care of. Pre-most of history, families did that. So they had this in their home for that occasion. And so they would take that jar and anoint that body, prepare that body, wrap it in linen for its burial. She goes out, gets one of those, comes back. It would have been in such a, a sealed jar that you would literally break it to open it. And Judas, in a minute, is going to point fingers and say it's a waste of money. He says, it's worth a year's wages, probably a laborer's wages, but still a lot of money. And so she breaks it open, doesn't say anything to anybody, and she starts to anoint Jesus' feet. First century, sandals walking around, dusty all the time. Somebody comes to your home, you want to show them a place of honor, not unusual to cleanse their feet. Very unusual to use this expensive nard. So she anoints her feet, and then this is going to be a very difficult visual reference for you, but she took her hair down. I know, mine would be more like buffing the nails. But she took her hair down and she starts to dry his feet. Inappropriate. One commentator said, taking her hair down in public in that setting, in that society in the first century would be very similar to the Victorian age where women wore the long dresses all the way to the floor and you didn't even show your ankle if in a dinner party, a lady just hiked her dress up to her hip. That's how inappropriate it was for her to take her hair down in public and start to dry his feet. She doesn't care. Here's my question. Was this her second jar of nard? Her brother's already died. Her brother has been brought, brought, brought back from the grave. And if you remember that story, he gets sick. Mary and Martha have seen enough of Jesus and his miracles to know they gotta call Jesus. So they send word for Jesus to come back. But the scripture says he tarries. In other words, he does not come quickly. And Lazarus dies. And when he gets there, Lazarus has already been dead for days and is in the tomb. And you remember the story where Lazarus, or Jesus came up and if you were ever in church camp or Sunday school and had to memorize scripture, you like this one. Why? It was the shortest one in the New Testament. Two words. What is it? Jesus, Jesus wept. He cried. Why did he cry? He knew the Paul Harvey rest of the story. He knew what was going to happen. He knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. But he had empathy for his friends that experienced all this grief. And he calls Lazarus come forth. Remember, they were, they say, hey, don't do that. He's been in there for a while. But he does. And the miracle happens. So Mary and Martha would not have not anointed Lazarus. So they undoubtedly had another jar of nard and they would have prepared their brother's burial and the nard would not have been the only thing to touch his body. Their tears would have mixed with the nard. And so Mary remembers all that. And she sees Jesus, the one responsible for the resurrection of her brother. And she says, I got another jar. I'm gonna get my jar. I am not gonna waste this. Because here's, this is the gospel according to Phil. Here is my theory that Mary remembers anointing her brother and in that experience, taking care of his body, has to have thought at some stage, this is the most generous, extravagant thing that I've ever done for my brother and he's dead. I wish I'd have done something when he was alive. She's not gonna waste that with Jesus. Jesus. So Jesus is reclining or uh, sitting. She's cleaning, uh, cleaning his feet with her, the nard. And then the scripture says, the fragrance filled the room. Isn't it amazing how an aroma can trigger a memory? You know, you go into one of the stores that sells all the fancy candles and things like that, and they've got them that smell like strawberry shortcake or or Christmas, or you know, whatever. And every time you smell one, it triggers some kind of a memory. And so here, gospel according to Phil again, everybody's at a festive time at a dinner party until she breaks open that jar. 
And then when the fragrance filled the room, I think everybody there, because they would have taken care of their own relatives in the past, are transported back to a time of sadness and grief in their own lives. Maybe even not even realizing why they're sad all of a sudden. Until they look around and they find Mary and what she's doing. And that's when Judas decides to pop up his head. See, it's hindsight. We know Judas. Not all, you know... Through years, uh, through the centuries, there have been a lot of kids named Matthew and a lot of kids named Mary. We don't name our kids Judas too often, you know? Why? Because we know what he does. He's going to be the one that betrays Jesus. They don't know that. Matter of fact, the disciples undoubtedly are all there, but he's the only one mentioned in the story. Why? Because he was the stalwart, the foundation in many ways. He's the guy that kept the money. They probably thought, this is a good guy. He's like the one that serves on the church board, man, a volunteer treasure, gives of his time and energies. Scripture says, though, it wasn't because he was just really nice, wanted to make sure everything was done properly. It's because he was a thief. And he would like to pilfer, put his hand in the bag every so often. He says, why are you doing that? That's worth a year's wages. And then it unfolds. Here's what I want you to see. And these are life lessons from this story. Number one, our love and devotion for Jesus and each other needs to be expressed while there's an opportunity. You have opportunities in life. You have crossroad moments in life. And many of them are prompting you to be generous to somebody, to be generous to God, to be generous to the church, to be generous to your family. And it's how you react. And you don't get to go back and take those moments again. Thomas Carlyle was a Scottish essayist. He was a self-absorbed person, very myopic in his world. He loved to sit in his study and just write. Wrote very heady books. Some say he would not have married if he had not married his personal secretary. He just did not get out that much. But his wife became ill. He knew she was ill. And he was not cold toward her, but he had no clue at how quickly she was deteriorating until she passed away. And then he was crushed. And his friends record the story that on the day of her burial, they took her, had the the funeral, he came home and he went into her room and he found her diary. And there are a couple excerpts. Yesterday, Thomas spent an hour with me and it was like being in heaven, I love him so. I've listened all day to hear my husband's footsteps in the hall, but now... It is late, and I guess he doesn't have time to come. And his friend said that he, they found him later, back at the graveside, on his knees, just muttering over and over, if I had only known, if I'd only known. See, here's the point I want you to see. Some opportunities never return. People grow old and die. Accidents happen. Disease interrupts. Children grow up. Friends move away. Circumstances change. And you don't always get the second and a third opportunity. So when you feel the impulse, the prompting of God into your heart to be generous, react, the circumstances may never be that way again. In verse 4, J- Judas objects and it says, well, you should sound, give that to the poor. I mean, that's where the year's wages. And that sounds logical to some degree. It's almost counterintuitive. We almost expect Jesus to say, oh, don't waste this on me. It's not what he says. Interesting. I think part of it is that it's Jesus illustrating the seasons of generosity, the seasons of opportunity, the different circumstances in our life and at different times. But also, he says, you always have the poor among you. And that sounds cold and callous, doesn't it? You always have the poor among you. This is the same Jesus that when people would press in on him to the degree that they'd reach out just to touch the hem of his garment, he'd stop whatever he's doing, even though he was somewhat irritated by it, and say, who did that? Who touched me? Which is crazy, you're in a crowd. Who touched me? And he'd find out who that person was that was so desperate wanting a miracle in their lives, and he would perform that miracle. He's not a man without compassion. This is the one when the disciples looked at everybody that had come to the countryside to listen to Jesus, and they'd been there all day, and they had not eaten And he says, well, let's just feed them. And they say, we can't. I mean, we don't have enough food and we don't have enough money to go and buy enough food for all these people. See, I think if you read that properly, the disciples were not being totally unreasonable. They were saying, okay, so they missed a meal. They won't die. They can go home because they've been there all day. And then Jesus says, well, wait a minute. Let's let's bring together. We've got some some loaves, some fishes. 
Let's, let's share what we have and see what happens and let God do something with that. It's an opportunity. Don't waste the opportunity when you're prompted to be generous. Two, this is important. When you express love and generosity, expect criticism. I think that's the lesson of the story. When you do something generous, expect criticism. There's always somebody in the age of social media where the warriors sit behind the keyboards. There's always some bright person. I'm being facetious. There's always somebody that's taking shots and shooting missiles. I read an article about weddings because we're coming into that season. And one of the articles actually postured this thought that in light of the divorce rate being high, why would you spend money on a wedding? It's a bad investment. Well, here's my thing. The next time you're invited to a wedding and you're thinking of bringing a gift for the bride and groom, just stop at a 24-hour gas station and maybe get them a couple Hershey bars. It won't last long, neither would their, their, their marriage. No, you don't do that. If you're contemplating getting married, if you're sitting with your significant other and you're planning your marriage, you don't say, hey, honey, let's save money because you know it's a 50-50 chance this isn't gonna work. We don't wanna waste the cash. You're doomed. You don't do that. Why? Because you enter into it with optimism because you know this decision is one of the most important decisions I'll ever make in my life. And all my other decisions in life will either be better or worse based upon how well I did this one. And so I want to make sure I give it the best, my, the best that I possibly can. So how about church buildings? Should we spend money on stuff like that? Should we? I've got a church right now that using the COVID shutdown decided that the, with, when you look at junior high, senior high kids and the mental health that's going on and kids contemplating suicide, and this has been a very, very tough 14 months for that whole group. And so they developed a curriculum called the Players Box. And they've broken it down, the kids that are interested in academics or those that are interested in sports or those that are interested in arts, and they're completely changing their building, how it can be used in those three areas. It's cost them money. At a time when everybody else is retreating, they're charging, going ahead. Is that a good thing? Someone, I guarantee, happens every time. Someone, social media especially, it used to be the age of newspapers, they're dying, so now it's social media will be on there shooting missiles at that particular church, whoever the church is, about when they see what they're doing and talk about, is that a waste of money, a church spending that kind of money on something? That same society never questions how much it costs to develop one ride at Disneyland. Do you know, I, I looked this up. Disney's had over 10 rides that cost over $100 million each to develop. 10. Now, I'm not anti-Disney. I've been to Disney. I, you know, you go, you spend, spend like $400, includes a Coke, and you get in, and you stand in line for like two hours for a ride. It's two minutes and 32 seconds. At some point in that ride, it makes you go like this, whoo, up in the air so they can take your picture and sell you the picture when you leave the park. I, I get that. And you think, maybe I'll go back and do it again, but I don't know, two, another two hours just to get in line again. I'm not against that, but isn't it interesting that what's happened, and it's been vocalized in the last year by a lot of folks, is the belief is the church is not essential. Maybe something like that could be essential. The church isn't essential. So when we are generous towards our institution of faith, and we believe it is a God-ordained institution given to the world to make a difference and reach people that don't know God, and we create effective tools to be able to do that, that's being prompted by the Spirit, but it's also understand you will be criticized. Two things to always ask. When you're prompted and you're gonna do something really big, you're gonna really be generous, two things. Ask yourself, is this gift I'm about to give a valid expression of my love for Christ? Is it a valid expression? That's important. David, talking about facilities, said, is it right for me to live in a house of cedar and the Lord to dwell in a tent? He's in his palace. He's looking at the tabernacle and saying, hey, you know what? Come on, is this... A should I not give God my best? Why is it that so many of us, when it comes to every ever avenue of our lives, where we want our kids to go to school, the kind of jobs and careers that we pursue, the houses that we live in, the vacations that we take, everything, we try to do the best we can. And then we turn to God and church and we say, that's good enough. I think when the world watches, they watch our generosity too. So second, though, is it the only expression of our generosity? We don't want to just build fancy buildings that are like museums in the future. Go look at Europe. There's some beautiful buildings with no one in them. 
So is it my only expression of generosity? Remember that church I told you that's changing their whole facilities for how they're gonna help with junior high and senior high kids? When COVID hit, they said, you know what? There's gonna be a lot of working poor, people that are just struggling. They're not getting stuff. And what if we could just help with one thing? What if there's a way we could do groceries? And so they send out, use their platforms, and they asked everybody in their church, said, when you go to Walmart, you get your curbside delivery, get some extra groceries, and a stop by the church. We'll have people designated, the, the whole mask and the distancing stuff, and they'll take your extra groceries, take it in. We're going to bag it, and then we're going to use those same platforms, reach out to our community and say, if you're hungry and if you just need some groceries during this tough time, you can get a week's worth of groceries if you start, show up at this building at this time. And the first offering... 1,600 families lined up for groceries. They did it a week later and 3,000 families came. So it's not my only expression of generosity. There's the compassion, there's the heart. There's gotta be different arteries to the heart. So expect, verse six, remember Judas says, he questions it and Jesus said it was because of it, he was a thief. What's the difference between Mary and, and Judas? It's only motive. If your background pushes you to hoard resources, if you're the way you're wired, you're just a tight-fisted individual holding on tight and you're afraid somebody might cheat you or trick you, it's gonna be a struggle for you to practice that open-handed generosity. Jesus' response surprises Judas. When Jesus says, wait, 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 don't, no, no, leave her alone, verse seven, Jesus replied, it was intended, and this is interesting, that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You'll always have the poor among you, but you'll not always have me. This is a fulfillment of prophecy. Now, they don't know. I guarantee they're all sitting around the room listening to him, and they're saying, wait a minute, what's he talking about his burial? They don't know he's going to be arrested. They don't know he's going to be crucified in a matter of days. And remember the story as we lead up to Easter? Jesus is arrested, he's crucified, and then he's taken down from the cross after he dies. It's too close to the Passover. Jewish custom will not allow his body to be dealt with. So they hurriedly pull him down before sundown and throw him into a borrowed tomb, and they're going to come back when they're permitted to anoint and prepare his body for burial. The people around Jesus, the women in particular that were waiting at the tomb the next day, they didn't watch him on the cross and say, hey, I know the rest of the story. He's going to come down. I know he's going to be resurrected. I know this is not the end. They thought it was the end. That's why they were there the next day because then they were going to anoint him and wrap him in linen and leave him in a tomb forever. And when they get there, what happens? The angels are there. Hey, he's not here. He's gone. So in history, this is a fulfillment of prophecy. His body was never prepared for burial. It had already been anointed. And then they said, for this time on, just like 2021 in Shiloh, Illinois, every time the gospel message is preached, Mary's story will be told and she'll be remembered for her generosity. Three life lessons and cautions I want to end with. Number one, be reluctant to judge the extravagance of other people. Be reluctant to judge the extravagance of other people. You don't know. You just don't know. You don't know enough about what it is that they have or they're doing. And we're so judgmental, especially now in the age of social media where people only portray themselves as always eating fun food and always going fun places and always looking like they're happy with their fun friends. And so if you're not careful, you get very judgmental and you don't know. Let's, what, what if for a month, minute, what if I suddenly get a surprise envelope in the mail from an attorney this week that says I have inherited a million dollars from a, a long lost relative? First of all, so shut our eyes and enjoy that moment because it ain't going to happen. But I get a million bucks. I'm like, wow. And my wife and I look at it and say, this is such a tremendous blessing. And we have no idea that this was ever going to happen. Don't even know that relative. So we're going to do something really crazy. We, over the years, we've been exposed to really cool ministries around the world. We're going to take half of that money and just give it away to cool stuff that we know are making a difference. And the other half, I'm going to buy a really cool car. I'm going to go on a vacation. And what do you see? You see the car. See the vacation. You just don't know. Second, second caution, and this is only for a small group of us, but it, it is important. Be receptive to the generosity from other people. See, 
Our pride gets in the way and somebody does something really nice for us and there's a percentage of us that want to push back on that. It's like, no, 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 I don't want to be, I don't want to be in debt to you. I don't want to feel like I'm a charity case and I don't receive. We've got to learn to be received because they need to experience the joy of generosity and giving. And then third, be responsive to the opportunities for love to be expressed. If you don't remember anything else today, this is the piece. 2 Corinthians 9 says each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Be responsive to the opportunities. When God pricks your heart, when you're prompted, I believe every one of us experienced this. And if you're not careful, you've got all these little things, these tripwires you build up around your heart that says, don't be tricked, don't be sucked in, don't be gullible. And we start being immune to that prompting. Be responsive. Mary's story of going and getting the nard, the inappropriate thing and breaking it open, ends up fulfilling prophecy, ends up being a foundational teaching point, but it was because of the impulse that God had put in her heart. Every one of us has a jar. Every one of us. Maybe it's time. Maybe you, you rationalize, say, I'd really like to help with that. I'd really like to plug into that. I'd really like to be a part of that, that thing, that ministry, whatever it happens to be. And if you're not careful, you rationalize yourself into mediocrity. So we prioritize what we feel is important. Whether we're giving time or giving funds, it's the same way. So when you're prompted, when that's laid upon your heart, wouldn't it be an amazing world if every time we're prompted by God to be generous to somebody else, we did? We were. Marriage is better. Workplace is better. Family's better. Church is better. World better. Would you pray with me? Dear God, I thank you for your truth. I thank you for your word that we don't go through life just wondering what it is we're supposed to do, how we're supposed to live our lives, that you have given this thing, this Bible that's been handed down. And over and over again, even this recently, more Dead Sea Scrolls that were found. I mean, there's just so much validity to the strength of this word. And then your promise that through your spirit that if we'll just take the time, read and put it into our hearts, that it doesn't come back empty. So for all these folks that are here today, that in a crazy time when we're driven by fear, they choose faith and they gather together with other believers, use this as an opportunity to pierce our hearts and may we be known in this community as generous people. It's in Jesus' name, amen.